which is Martin Tugwell, Programme Director of England's Economic Heartland, and he's going to outline the progress today. Martin, the floor is yours. Ten minutes. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here. This is our second conference at Silverstone, and if I look back over 18 months and think about where we were, um, those of us working on this project, probably about three or four of us in terms of the, uh, the, the support for this team and for this project, uh, I'm now responsible for a business unit that involves 10 people. Um, it's a business unit that has increasing capability and capacity to not only work on behalf of the local partners, but to be able to commission work on behalf of the local partners and to be able to engage even more effectively with government and uh, other agencies. The driver for all of what we do is the three guiding principles that Councillor Tech will talk about when he, uh, that original conversation. They're very much focused on the strategic issues. We know intuitively that there are certain parts of infrastructure where they are of a scale and they go across boundaries, where it makes sense to work at scale, to work together in partnership. We also know that there's a benefit of sharing experience on common issues. And later today, you'll hear from Steve Kent, and then during the lunch break, you'll see the work that the delivery partners are doing. Again, a step change in terms of working collaboratively across contracts, across borders, towards a common objective. And it's about simplifying. You heard Councillor Tett talk about there's an awful lot of inertia that we put into the system. And if our whole ambition is about speeding up delivery, enabling to have the infrastructure that will allow things to happen, we've got to break through that inertia and we need to make things happen faster. If I look back over 18 months and kind of reflect on some of the things that have happened, there's a lot of progress. So it's sometimes I've, I find myself reflecting that it feels as if we're not making much progress and then I look back over 18 months and think if with a small team we've achieved an awful lot. In terms of our relationship with Highways England, um, we have been involved in the Expressway study, but also the other two big strategic studies that were announced as part of the road investment strategy, the M25, the A1M, and we've been able to make sure that the issues and the uh, concerns of the local partners, the issues which relate to economy and housing are being fed in much more strongly into those, uh, uh, into those studies. And building on the announcement this morning, we'll be then taking forward the work on our own connectivity study in partnership with Highways England and DFT to make sure that as work on the expressway is taken forward, we don't forget that we need to connect it into the rest of the network. It's no good having a spine if that spine is not having the connections into the areas of opportunity, both economic and housing. We've had the ability through the work of the, uh, the business unit to influence the debate at the national level, engagement with uh, Highways England. I have to say who've been, as they put together their work on the road investment strategy number two, the level of engagement and the reach out to the business unit on behalf of the Strategic Alliance has been fantastic and an experience that all of us as STBs have, have welcomed. Uh, we've worked very closely with um, our colleagues in other STBs, and it's great to see Councillor Glazer from Transport for the South East here today, because him, uh, along with ourselves as Councillor Tett and Ca uh, Mayor Dave uh, uh, Hodgson as our Transport Forum, along with our partners in uh, Midlands Connect and Transport for North, put together a single response to the major road network consultation. So for the first time, you had 70% of the country, of 70% of England, being having a single response on a particular transport issue. And we're also starting to get into the stage where we can make and help support proposals for funding. So as Councillor Tech was talking about, it's great to have these ambitions. We need to see the money. July, we were asked by the Department for Transport to put forward proposals for early entry into the next major road network programme, programme that will start from 2020 to 21. We were delighted as a strategic alliance to be able to put forward two packages, one supporting growth in Aylesbury, one supporting growth and, and transport along the corridor in Hertfordshire, and we look forward to hearing from the department and government later this year as to how those bids have got on. But that's an example of how we've been able to start raising the profile for about £80 million worth of investment. Rail is a key issue for us. These are the big strategic issues. East-West Rail, we've seen progress, and we'll hear from Will Gallagher at the East-West Rail company about how they're moving forward with that. But from a strategic perspective, it's not just about East-West connectivity. It's also about recognizing there's a North-South opportunity here, connecting Northampton, Milton Keynes, Bletchley, Aylesbury, High Wycombe with Old Oak Common and the Park Royal Development Center. 
this is a major opportunity to create a new connection across the corridor that we do not have. If we're trying to achieve net betterment in terms of growth without increasing the environmental impact, taking advantage of these things are going to be important. We've also seen a greater involvement in the franchising process. There are a number of franchises going on at the moment. One of the ones that have been exercising us as a transport forum particularly is the East Midlands, where frankly the message from the transport forum has been great that there is a new franchise, but actually the way the specification was written was almost written two or three years behind the curve. It doesn't reflect the significance of the National Infrastructure Commission's report on the corridor. It doesn't reflect the significance of actually improving connectivity, frequency of services, the stopping patterns in the towns in between the East Midlands and London. It doesn't recognize we need to do more in those locations. Those are areas where, as a transport uh, forum, we're pushing, and as the business unit, we can actually pick up and take the message forward. Wider strategic infrastructure has been good progress as well. Um, another example of how we're using the funding that we have from our local partners and from the department, worth being aware that the funding for this, uh, for the business unit, is a combination of commitment by the individual local authorities to invest in that capacity, but it's also a commitment by the government to invest in a strategic uh, planning capability. We're currently preparing a business case that will be put forward for funding to secure digital connectivity along East-West Rail Corridor. So when the Western section comes forward, making sure it has the digital connectivity that we absolutely need as we move forward. Innovation, regulatory frameworks, you'll hear about that later. The national policy statement. All of these are aspects of our work which we've been able to move forward at pace over the, the last um, 18 months. And it's also working with our colleagues, again, in terms of working with our colleagues in the other STBs, but that relationship with London and TfL is becoming increasingly important as we move forward. Councillor Tech talked about the context and with, within which we're working, and there are some real opportunities here, but it's also very important for all of us to understand that business as usual is not going to be the way we solve these challenges. And some of the challenges that we have we need to start getting our heads around because as we work on the transport strategy, as our colleagues in the local enterprise partnerships work on the economic vision, as our colleagues in the local planning authorities start to work on their spatial planning, we need to get our heads around some of the key challenges. Challenges such as, great that we are in terms of our economic productivity, when you compare us with the rest of the world, there are still some gaps, some challenges that need to face. We need to think about, reflect about how society has different balances and different challenges. Our expectations as customers, we are all users of infrastructure. Our expectations are changing constantly. So we need to make sure that we're ahead of the curve and we have the ability to have the flexibility to plan for and change the direction forward. And remembering that when we're looking at 20, 30 years or forward, we've probably got two or three economic cycles in that. We've probably got five or six technological cycles. So if we think we know the answers now, we know we will be wrong, but we need the flexibility to move forward. The spatial geography is going to change. That's not meaning to say we're going to actually physically move places, but if you can get from Oxford to Cambridge in just over an hour by train, as opposed to two and three quarter hours via London by train, if you can get across the corridor in roads and investment uh, in, in highways, then the pattern of travel is going to change. The pattern of tra travel will change such that maybe we don't need to make the kind of investments we have. We still need to make significant investment, but the nature of it will be different moving forward. Which comes back to also this point about as we look forward to place shaping, how do we actually use the investment that we make in infrastructure to help support those making uh, more local decisions and more local planning around the nature of the place that we have moving forward? In terms of the net betterment, I was always struck by the National Infrastructure Commission saying there's a great opportunity here in terms of the economic opportunity, but we need to achieve it in net betterment. So we need to make sure that in looking for this and striving for this moving forward, we not only have the ability to support economic growth, but we do it in a way that actually sees a better quality of environment, both urban and rural, both built and natural. If we don't achieve that at the same time, then actually we've missed the opportunity. In terms of the work moving forward, that's kind of looking back over the last 18 months. In terms of looking forward, we've got a very extensive program of work moving forward for the next three years. Key focus for that, 
developing the transport strategy over the next, um, uh, next eight to 12 months. And you'll hear later from my colleague, Naomi Green, who's recently joined us as the head of technical program, who will talk a little bit about how we're going to take that forward with working in partnership. We're also preparing our proposal with, for the, uh, to establish a, st a statutory subnational transport body. And we want to make sure that in looking for the statutory powers from government, we have the powers and the responsibilities bring, brought down from Whitehall that allow us to deliver the transport strategy that is being set out at the same time. Looking ahead, real opportunities. I'm really inspired by the work we do at the moment. I think it has a fantastic location, a fantastic opportunity, but there are some challenges. You heard Councillor Tech talk earlier about joining up the strategic conversation. It's actually kind of getting a little bit embarrassing at one level when you're in meetings with, uh, with individuals from different government departments and you're actually acting as a facilitator to introduce government departments to one another. I know they're busy, um, but that's the benefit of having a strategic body. If you've got a small strategic body who has that ability to look across the agendas on behalf of local partners and to be able to join up on behalf of government departments, then I'd like to think we're perfectly formed and very powerful in our ability to help support both partners. Delivery. I have very deliberately chosen the picture there. We'll hear a bit more about the expressway later. But one of the litmus tests for the transport forum is the Black Cat to Caxton Gibbet roundabout and, and the improvement there. Now, the reason that has become a litmus test is if somebody is going to ask you to step up, if somebody is going to ask you to accelerate what you are doing, you kind of want to know that they're going to be alongside you and be, uh, with you in terms of their investment. So when we hear the call for accelerating growth, to see pro uh, proposals like the Black Cat Roundabout get delayed for two years, it has an impact in terms of the confidence of the local population. It has a a an impact on the confidence of local businesses to make the choice. So we need to really nail this issue about delivery. And when we say we will deliver it, we will deliver it. Next summer is going to be a really important timeline. Major road network investment proposals going in, investments around uh, the spending review. So we need to use the time over the, uh, over the autumn and into the spring to think about how we build the transport strategy, how we build the case for the subnational transport body, and how we build the case for prioritization moving forward. Because at the end of the day, um, we need to make the case. Success as we are, we need to make the case moving forward. At the heart of that, and you'll hear it as a theme, I think, throughout today. At the heart of that is collaborative working. And at the heart of that is a collaborative success. So with your help, with your support, with your engagement, we will make that dream come true sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Let me introduce Will Gallagher, uh, Strategy Director for East West Rail Company. And he's going to tell us about, uh, well, about the East West Rail. So, uh, uh, Will, the floor is yours. Will. I think that's the mic just come on. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to assure Martin that we are getting on with it. Um, as we speak at this uh, very uh, moment, uh, we actually have enabling works going on not too far away from here. So the first section of this railway is definitely, is definitely getting underway. The other thing that I'm very pleased to provide some assurance on is the level of focus that I'm seeing in government on this. Um, every two weeks, um, I spend about half an hour with the Secretary of State, who is continuously asking me, um, are we nearly there yet? Um, and continuing to put pressure on to make sure we're doing our job. So there's absolutely no question um, that that level of engagement from uh, senior ministers is, is almost unprecedented on projects of this, of this type. So we're, we're definitely getting that focus and that pressure. And one of the things um, that government has done is set up East West Railway Company, which is a new organization that we've been mobilizing over the summer um, to really drive forward this project. And it is a sign of the commitment uh, that government is making. The thing that this company, I think, brings is a real focus on the why we're doing it. Um, and that means driving economic growth and prosperity uh, for the people who live in this part of the world. And we're determined to make sure we design a railway project that really does deliver on that. And I think that shows up in, in three particular ways. The first is the kind of railway we design and where the railway goes. So we're currently in a process of uh, 
designing the potential root options for the link between Bedford and uh, Cambridge. We're already underway on the construction of the, the first half, but the next bit from Bedford to Cambridge, um, we're currently thinking about where that goes. And we're not taking the traditional transport modeling approach of what is the quickest journey time and the shortest, cheapest uh, route to build. We're doing a lot of modeling looking at the wider economic benefits, the productivity gains, the GVA benefits, the needs of businesses, how you develop communities. Um, all those things will come into the decision that we're making such that the railway is here to drive the prosperity, so we should build a railway that is designed to drive that prosperity. We are absolutely committed to that. And as we come forward with those proposals to engage with people who live here, people who work here, with the businesses that are growing here. Um, and that will be happening at the back end of this year uh, to talk about where that, uh, where that next stage of East West Rail goes. Um, you will see that real focus on um, the kind of economic benefits. And we're very keen to hear from you um, how we continue to drive that forward. I think the other reason and the other way uh, the focus we have on, on economic benefit shows up um, is thinking about the communities and the passengers that we're here to serve as well. So we're currently um, reviewing the designs on, on, a, on a section of the railway and we, we're taking a look at Bletchley Station. Um, and is Bletchley Station really in its current design suited to the long-term needs of this area and to the growth and the placemaking in Bletchley itself. And we've been doing some work with Milton Keynes Council, with Network Rail, to look at how, when we build the east-west rail bit of Bletchley Station, we do that in such a way so that it opens it up um, to the rest of the town and it provides easy access into the town centre. And you know, if I'm frank, I don't think the current design currently does that. And I think we need to do a bit better. And we're working with uh, local partners to help us do that. And that will show itself up in like, small design decisions about how wide the entrances are to make passenger flows easier. All those kinds of areas that are about making sure we're today focused on the passenger, focused on the places that we're there uh, to serve. And finally, in this section on why we're doing this, um, it's so important that we remain firmly rooted, um, taking on board the views of uh, the local area. And that's why I'm absolutely delighted uh, that we, when we have our inaugural uh, program board on this project in the new arrangements that East West Railway Company uh, bring together, um, that we will have local leaders represented on that board um, because it is so important that we remain interested in meeting the needs and the development plans of this area. Um, so, as I say, very focused on the why and making sure we are driving that economic growth, we are serving the communities that we're uh, here to, to, to help, and that we are very plugged in to the local leadership that is coming from the likes of England's Economic Heartland, the East West Rail Consortium. The other area that East West Rail is here to focus on is the how. It's to make sure we're delivering this as quickly as we possibly can and as cost effectively as we possibly can. And I think that's something that's unique. It's a bit techy, this, but it is very important that we're bringing together scheme design, so actually what's the, what's the infrastructure that you're building, and the business case development, so the, the, the strategic, the why that I've been speaking about. Because it's only when you put those two things together, and that's what East West Railway Company does, that you end up building the right kind of infrastructure, and you can really challenge the delivery of that infrastructure to make sure it's going to deliver the benefits that, that we all want. And we're doing a lot of work on can we, by the way we sequence the program, by the way we design some of the structures, by the type, the approach that we take to earthworks, get this done quicker, and can we get it done more cost effectively? And whilst doing those two things, can we look at it in terms of the whole life of the project so that we don't do gold plating, 
but we do do future proofing um, so that we don't spend our time building white elephants, but we put in the kind of infrastructure, we make the investments that are really going to meet our to meet our to meet the needs of the area. So we are, as I say, we think we'll get the first section of this railway open. Um, it's already underway. The construction's happening. 2023 is when we want to get trains running. Um, the Secretary of State keeps telling us it needs to be earlier than that, and we are working damn hard to make sure um, we, we drag it forward as much as we can. We're not going to make promises we cannot deliver. Uh, too many people have stood on stages and announced big, grand opening dates and then not delivered on that. But we are, do, we are looking quite forensically at how we accelerate uh, this program and how we make sure we're uh, cost effective. And already that's showing itself up in changes to designs. It's showing itself up in uh, taking a slightly different approach to the way we do earthworks. So we're recycling more material. So therefore, we have to bring in less stuff. That means less lorry movements for local people. It also means a lower cost. So big focus on the why, but also a relentless sense of de attention to detail on the how. Uh, and I hope that demonstrates our commitment to getting this done in the right way and confirms government's commitment to, to testing a new way of uh, doing this and, and holding us to account for that. Thank you very much. Next up, Ian Parsons, Senior Planning Manager from Highways England, who's going to talk to us about the, uh, the highways ambitions. So, uh, Ian. Good morning, everyone. It's very good to, to see you all. Certainly the first time I've been to this venue, and what a fantastic venue it is as well, so I would hope to come back. I was very pleased to, when Martin was talking, talking about the engagement of Highways England and how that's good, good that has been. I'm very pleased to hear that, and I can confirm I'm part of a small group to up our game engagement with STBs around the country. I currently are covering the Midlands and the East, but we are recruiting more people so we can dedicate that engagement and up our game. So I'm very pleased that that's already filtering through. Um, OK, as you all you will know, Highways England took over from Highways Agency um, 20. 15 April, um, at which time we were tasked to deliver the government's RIS, a 12 million billion investment in the first road period, going from 15 to 20. So, how are we doing? Let's see if we can move on. Um, I'm not going to go through the details, but we are doing very well. This was a snapshot taken maybe a month or so ago, so these figures are continually moving. Nonetheless, we are on track and doing a very good job, I would say. Not just the major improvements, but running down through these, I would pick up the lesser ones, the cycle pass, things that sometimes we get missed. Hi, was England involved with cycle pass? Yes, we are. We're putting a lot of those in around on the network. And also the impact of noise. We know how annoying that can be for a lot of the people living close to the SRN. We've got a comprehensive package that are putting insulation into properties and a range of other measures to try and make life better for those people living close to the SRN. Moving on down through there, I would pick up on the one second from the bottom. That's the Growth and Housing Fund, um, a fund that is available to help out stalling developments around the country. To date, we reckon we've enabled 40,000 new homes and a corresponding number of jobs around the country. These are for sites which are stalling where there is a need for mitigation on the SRN, but the viability of the sites mean it's very difficult for the developers to fund that. So we've stepped in, helped out with some match funding, been a very successful fund. Um, and I will say a bit more because there are some real um, success stories within this area under that particular fund. Okay. But what you want to know about today, of course, is that 12 billion investment that r related to, I believe, about a 2 billion investment in the East. So how does that relate to this area? And this is where I'm sure I'm going to raise some concerns and issues within the audience here. Let's run down through this list. Of course, the top of the list, the scheme that's on the ground at the moment, which I understand is the largest road upgrade project in the country at the moment. A 1.5 billion investment to improve between Cambridge and Huntington, 21 miles of improvements, bypass, and of course the removal of the viaduct. 
Um, that is going very well, started in 2016 and due to end in 2020, a long project. I'm sure there have been issues for people living close by as that scheme is constructed. Things can continue to develop. Only last Friday on that particular scheme, it was announced that that route, once it is in place, could become a motorway. Um, I, that has raised all sorts of concerns and issues with local people. Nonetheless, it would, if in place, would provide a complete motorway link between London and Peterborough. So that is on the cards. We're currently looking into that and seeing how that can be secured. That would allow strategic traffic to make its journey um, much more reliable, but also allow local traffic to use the most appropriate routes so that we get traffic on the right routes. Also, having a motorway, of course, the advantages, overall journey time reliability um, could be increased. So a real interesting development there, and we wait to see that going further. I will miss the next one out and run down and come back to that. I'm not going to miss it. I'm sure that um, people would make sure I didn't do that. But we're smart motorway, um, junction 6 to 8. That's due to start in 1920. At least 110, possibly 150 million investment there. That's one of the busiest links on that um, link for motorway. And we know it's already got existing challenges with congestion. And also, we know that every junction um, nearby has housing either in place or coming forward. So it's going to add to the existing problems. So a real good investment there coming forward, 1920, which will help those developments to come forward, helping the economic in that area and also the wider economics for the country. Okay, um, let's go back to Black Cat, to Cats and Gibbet, and I very well pick up on the comments that Martin said, and I know there will be people in this room disappointed that when our delivery plan was published back in July, it became clear that the start date for that scheme had actually slipped from this road period into road period two. We're currently predicting a start within 2021. There are re good reasons for that um, It's slipping back. One of the first ones, I would say, it would allow the completion of the Cambridge to Huntington scheme, a major scheme which, of course, has imp um, it, it, it impacts on people living closely and people using the SRN. So not having two big schemes on the network at one time has got to be a good thing. But also it allows us to step back a bit and understand a bit more the implications of what is happening, the growth aspirations, and taking on board the outputs of the East of England study. Now that study is um, saying that more work is needed to understand the housing, the location, and the timing. And our colleagues in MHCLG are doing some work there. The outcome of that will feed in to ensure the scheme at Black Cat to Caps and Gimmick is exactly what is needed for now and for the longer term, helping local people and the strategic movement, which is vital, it needs to be in place. Now, we plan to be publishing our preferred route for that later this year and leading on to a start in 21-22. But I can assure the audience right here, right now, that we are committed to delivering that scheme. It's there, very clear, and the timetable is set out. That leads us on to Oxford Cambridge Expressway, the big one. Now, until last night, my notes were going to be talking about the engagement we'd had to date with local authorities, LEPs, businesses, about the corridors that had emerged through the um, strategic study. However, in the last hour, Jesse Norman has stood up in Milton Keynes, and he has confirmed that the government has selected Corridor B to go forward. Now, I don't have too many more details about that. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of press releases and information available to those who want to take further. However, that has been selected because it follows the East Rail Rail Corridor um, with options passing to the east or west of Oxford. This corridor provides better links to jobs, um, leisure, uh, services, health services, education. And in conjunction with that East Wales um, Rail, which we just heard about from um, Will, it allows people then to make um, decisions about their movements and what movement to use once that's in place So uh, for existing and new customers. So some very good news there. As I say, I have little more detail in front of me. I'm sure there will be more, far more information available that has been published on the internet. So some very large schemes, a real commitment from government and Highways England to be investing in this area, and I hope that is seen and accepted. 
I didn't want to miss out actually on the smaller schemes that are also doing very well in this area. Growth and housing schemes, and here I've got three listed with contributions 3 million, 5 million, 1.8. Smaller schemes, but it's schemes where we've come in, looked at the developments that are stalling, looking at the viability of those developments, and are helping out with small amounts of money to enable them to come forward. Now, nationally, the growth and housing uh, scheme, we reckon 45 jobs, 45,000 jobs, and 40,000 homes have been enabled over the last two, three years. A great success. Locally, we believe 1,500 jobs and nearly 5,000 homes have been helped by this fund. A really good news story, and because it's a lower level, sometimes underneath the um, visual people picking that up, but a very important one. I would hope as we go forward into road period two that somehow we continue with the good work that that has done this so far. But of course, we also know that MHLG have got a very big pot with its housing infrastructure fund of five billion, which is doing very similar things to what we've done with this much smaller pot, the growth and housing fund. Okay, I will move on. I just wanted to finish with this slide, really, which is talking about whilst quite clearly as we move into road period two, our time is going to be taking up um, greatly with the Oxford to Cambridge work that is needed. Um, obviously, now with that uh, decision on the B corridor, that means we will be out talking to a lot of people now to develop routes within that corridor, leading to a public consultation. And of course, then we will have a preferred route and taking it through DCO. Timings and such like, certainly available with the information that's been published today, and I'm sure we have people in the audience who will know more. Um, but in addition to that, of course, we are also engaged with government on putting together the um, RIS 2. And this slide actually shows you where we are at the moment. Up until the end of 17 and into 18, we were in that research stage. And there were various information and studies that fed into that information stage. Strategic studies I've mentioned, the road to growth. Now, this was the first time anyone in this part of um, business had actually put together a document showing how important the SRN was to the country's economy. Me, really highlighting the important points and maybe some of the low points that needed further work. So a very good document that's fed into this. But we mustn't also forget the maintenance and the operations of the asset as well. We've got a good asset, but we want to remain it in a very good condition as well. So the operations and maintenance are vital to feed in to ensure those are properly covered. Route strategies, 18 of those throughout the country, and I'm sure most of you here have had an opportunity to input saying what the issues are on the routes selected in those route strategies. There are low points and high points. A lot of information fed into our strategic road initial report, which was published at the end of December uh, and went out to a public consultation led by DFT. We're currently now in that decision uh, mode, moving on, in, as you say, to 1819. That is meaning a lot of engagement between our DFT colleagues and ourselves. We're working on our business, strategic business plan at the moment, which actually puts together information that will lead to the publication of draft RIS next year sometime, which will detail the schemes that will be in there. So we are moving on with more information and leading to the publication of that, which will actually lay out the uh, RIS 2, road period 2, taking it up to 25, and the schemes that Highways England will be required to deliver. I think that brings me to an end. Um, I think it does, so thank you very much for listening.